Okay, thank you for coming today. Uh, we have a local Point Loma Nazarene University uh, professor here with us today, David Cummings. Uh, David got his bachelor's degree in English literature from Point Loma, and then he moved to the University of Idaho, where he received his master's degree in zoology and a PhD in microbiology, molecular biology, and biochemistry. That was quite a PhD. Um, he completed his postdoc fellowship there at the Idaho National Engineering and Environmental Laboratory, at where he was promoted to principal scientist. He came back to Point Loma in 2004, where he advanced to professor of biology and teaches courses in tropical biology, or tropical ecology, biology and biochemistry, microbiology, and immunology. In 2012, he was named National Academics, um, Academics Education Fellow in the Life Sciences for participating in the National Academ Academies. 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 I've got to spell that wrong. <laughs> Academies. Summer Institute um, on Undergraduate Education in Biology. Um, he has received major funding for his work from NIH, DOA, DOE, MSF, and NOAA. He's published extensively in the field of environmental microbiology and antibiotic resistance. So his talk today will inform us about his work in environmental um, <coughs> reservoirs of mobile antibiotic resistant genes. Thanks, David. Can you guys tell me if you can hear me okay? Is my voice projecting well enough to the back of the room? I'd rather not be tied to the podium if I don't have to. If you can't hear me, you can do one of these things and and let me know. Um, I appreciate you guys inviting me to do this. This is really great. It's, it's fun to be able to share what we're doing with a science crowd who maybe isn't directly in this exact field. You, know, you end up preaching to the choir so often you, you feel like they, they know all these things already and, and you're not getting anywhere. So this is a, a great opportunity hopefully to share some new things that I'm hoping you guys will see some ties to all of your, your own individual interests as we go through this. Um, I like to start with acknowledgments because if I run out of time in the end, I don't want to miss out on this. Uh, you'll, you'll get a sense of the scope of this work. It's very big, it's very broad, it takes a lot of people. Uh, there's no way that the data I'm showing you all came out of uh, either my brain or my hands. There's a lot of people involved. At PLNU, we're an undergraduate institution, so keep in mind that the work you see done is being done by undergraduate researchers who are working, in my opinion, really at a master's level. They're doing some pretty fantastic work. This photo here, you see my pointer there. This photo here is my current lab group. Uh, we've got Chip, Cece, Kelly, Joy, and Ryan, uh, and they're here today. So if you get a chance to pick their brains and talk to them a little about their research, I'm sure they'd like to talk about that. Uh, this is my partner, Ryan Botts, who I couldn't do any of this without. He's my computational guy. And uh, he, he's the one that turns all these millions and millions of base pairs into something that actually makes sense that a biologist can start to work with. Uh, and he'll be here, hopefully. If he's not here yet, he'll be here later. Uh, this morning as well. Long list of PLNU students who have had their fingers in the work that you're going to see here today. And a couple of real key collaborators back at the University of Idaho. Ava Topp, who's a plasmid biologist, and Celeste Moran, who's a, a bioinformaticist. <coughs> um, and uh, as uh, Dr. Durant pointed out, uh, this takes money uh, and a lot of it, unfortunately. But we've been really, uh, really blessed to have uh, significant funding from the NIH in recent years and prior to that. Uh, their organizations, including my home university, have really kept us afloat when we needed to. Um, how many of you are familiar with our university, with PLNU, at some level? Yeah, not many. I find that's interesting in San Diego County, where we're considered one of the big four, right? UCSD, SDSU, USD, and PLNU. Yet a lot, we're, we're kind of quiet. You know, we sort of fly under the radar a little bit. So if you guys would indulge me for two minutes, uh, I'll introduce you to the school before we start talking about the science. Uh, we started back in 1902 in Pasadena as Pasadena College, and that land was leased, and we lost it very suddenly in a matter of weeks in 1974, and, uh, and uh, we were fortunate to find 90-some acres on the coast here in San Diego, transferred the entire student body, the entire faculty, everybody over in a matter of about two weeks to start the fall semester uh, in 1974, and that's where we're located now. It's a really wonderful location if you haven't been there. I invite you to stop by and come knock on my door if you do. <clears throat> the kinds of questions we get from parents, prospective parents who want to send their kids is, you know, what do, all the, what do all the scales and magazines have to say about your university? Kiplinger's Personal Finance puts out their top 100 best values every year. And we were number six in California uh, in Kiplinger's. 
and we were in pretty good company. We were ahead of us was Stanford, USC, Pepperdine, Santa Clara, and one other that I'm forgetting. So we, we, we were in pretty good company to, to have been uh, uh, named uh, number six in the state of California this past year. Uh, we're proud that uh, City of San Diego has named us Recycle of, Recycler of the Year for the past four of the past uh, six years. Sierra Club puts out America's 100 Greenest Schools every year in 2010 and 2011. We made that list. We don't know what happened in the last couple of years. Something changed, but uh, we lost a little green, I guess. I don't know what happened there. And this is a big one all the parents always ask about. Well, what about the U.S. News and World Report? Our category is called Regional Universities West, and we're number 17 out of a couple hundred schools in that category. So we're, we're really a, a pretty high-quality program, and I uh, and, uh, hope you guys will give us a chance and check us out and see what's going on there. Uh, as far as sciences go, we have a pretty heavy emphasis on the sciences. It's just under 40% of all the students at Point Loma are majoring in either one of the sciences directly or one of the allied health fields. That's a pretty remarkable number for a liberal arts institution. We have a really, really solid science program and we draw a lot of students into that program. And then another one we like to brag about is uh, our, our postgraduate acceptance rate into med school, vet school, dental school, graduate school, PT, PA, all those things everybody does after their bachelor's degree. We've got a greater than 90% acceptance rate on that. We do a pretty darn good job, I like to think, of preparing these students for their next step. <clears throat> I'm not going to get into everybody. Um, this isn't everybody in the biology department. There's a dozen of us. Uh, and we've got research going on from everything from uh, you know, my kind of work with microbes and DNA uh, to large-scale work with big cats in the cloud forest, if you're familiar with Dr. Mike Mooring's work. Uh, and everything in between, immunology, um, science education and learning processes, uh, neurobiology. Um, uh, Mike Durrell here has some pretty fantastic cutting-edge work that's all preclinical focused on um, both tumor reduction uh, strategies as well as some degenerative eye disease research that he works on. It's, uh, really fantastic stuff. And, and this is just biology. We have a whole chemistry department and they're all doing wonderful things in their own area as well. So the last thing I'll leave you with to think about with Point Loma, we are up to our eyeballs in construction right now. If you've been on our campus, uh, we've, we've removed like an acre of earth and we are in the process of putting together the Seder Science Hall and Matter Classroom Center. We've got 33,000 square feet of new uh, lab space coming in and, uh, and four new state-of-the-art classrooms. And if they stay on time, on track, like they tell us they are, we'll actually be in there next September, so just over a year from now. So we're making some, some great strides in, uh, in really bolstering the science that we do here. Probably more than you ever knew about Point Lama, right? Okay, enough of the sales pitch. Let's talk about science. That's why you guys are here, right? You want to talk about science a little bit. <clears throat> I'm going to start today by talking about the problem. The problem is that drug resistance has gone completely bananas across the whole planet. I'm trying to convince you about it if you're not already convinced. If you're not paying attention, you're not watching the news, you're not reading the literature, and you don't realize it, drug resistance is probably the biggest uh, uh, human clinical problem the world faces right now. We used to be able to manage infections. We're losing that ability right now. Why? We're going to talk about why that is, how it happens. We'll get into some of the background of resistance, how are bacteria resistant, so that we can understand the data that I'm going to show you eventually. We're also going to look at how how uh, resistant bacteria, in particular their DNA, you're going to see a really heavy, heavy emphasis on the genes that code for the drug resistance. And hopefully you'll understand why as we go uh, a little further. We're going to look at how that is released into the natural environment, creating reservoirs of drug resistance. And then we're going to consider possible ways for that to disseminate back into the human and animal populations. Once we kind of set the stage, that'll be about the first half of the time. Second half, we're going to look at our data uh, specifically in that context. Sound good? Okay. Feel free to interrupt at any time. And if I'm not looking at you and you're trying to say something, just throw something at me. Whatever you gotta do, get my attention, because I want to make sure that everybody's tracking as we go and as we kind of uh, build these ideas. So let's start with this first idea, that this first old claim that I made, that antibiotic resistance is on the rise globally, it's sort of taking over the planet, right? Is this true? Is this legit? Well, here's a figure from CDC, a pretty reliable epidemiological source. They, they, they keep track of all these numbers, at least within the United States. And what you can see is just going back to uh, the early 1980s, we had very low levels of resistance in uh, three key organisms that they were tracking at that time, Staphylococcus aureus, the Enterococci, and Pseudomonas species. These two, uh, these two are gram positives. This guy here is a gram negative. Remember some of your 
basic microbiology there. And what you see is over the course of the 80s into the 90s and continuing, we see resistance going from the low single digits into well over 50%. And if you talk to physicians, what they're going to tell you is that just about every staph infection we deal with now is a MRSA infection, multi-drug resistant staph infection. And they have a very limited set of drugs that they're able to use because of this, this selection that we've placed on the microbes out there for the resistant strains. Same is true with the Anarchoxy and the Pseudomonas species. So resistance is definitely on the rise among important pathogenic organisms. Here are some stats from some reliable sources, World Health Organization, CDC, NIH. So who says half a million new cases of multi-drug resistant tuberculosis arise each year globally, causing 150,000 deaths globally? And that's because of the multi-drug resistance the deaths are. We can manage TB infections if they are not drug resistant. When they hit that MDR category, we've pretty much lost a handle on it. It's between your immune system and the bug, whether you're going to make it through that or not. The majority of those deaths are because we've lost our ability to be able to treat those. I don't know if you guys realize just how prevalent TB is. We live here in the US where we're practically TB free. But the current estimates are around 2 billion people. So roughly a third of the planet is TB positive. That's a pretty remarkable, stunning number. And as we see that the dynamics of those infections shifting more and more towards the drug-resistant phenotype, we realize we're losing a handle on the most prevalent pathogen on planet Earth. That's a scary statistic. <coughs> CDC says that in 2010, uh, the majority of the salmonella clinical isolates in the US were resistant to quinolone drugs. We're going to talk more about quinolones in a few minutes. We think quinolones think Cipro. That's, that's one that most people are going to be familiar with. Very, very common class of drugs used for everything from uh, bloodborne infections to UTIs to sinus infections, gastrointestinal infections, etc. And it's for a variety of reasons. It's our best drug against salmonella. But we had this window in 2010 where just about every clinical strain that came in was non responsive to Cipro and quinolone drugs. So we very quickly have lost that. And Cipro is only about 15 years old. We very quickly lost the use of one of our most important drugs for fighting common infections. Uh, NIH says that more than 70% of the bacteria that cause hospital-acquired infections, so you go in for a procedure X, you come out with microorganism Z that you didn't start with, right? Uh, that more than 70% of those microbes are uh, resistant to our, the drugs that we would normally choose to fight them. Okay, so we have to go to alternatives that have downsides. They have maybe side effects with the patient, Maybe they, uh, maybe they, they cause uh, or raise resistance in other organisms, etc. For those of you that think more, more in terms of uh, quantitatively or thinking more in terms of uh, the economy, I love this quote from CDC. This is actually from published literature. Antibiotic resistant infections cost the U.S. approximately 20, and the latest number I saw was closer to $25 billion a year in excess costs. Not the infection, but the fact that it can't be fought with our standard first round drugs. Okay. We take away that resistance, we remove that 20 to $25 billion excess burden on our healthcare system. So if you feel that our healthcare system has already stressed the limit, which I think most of us are, are starting to wonder about that, um, then here's one key piece to it. We're, we're talking billions of dollars of impact just due to drug resistance. Okay? So between those two slides, my hope was to convince you this is a major problem. We've got a lot of data on the U.S., and there's more data globally that shows that this is not just local issue. Agreed? Okay. Let's think, let's go back to Bio 101 class here. It's more like, I don't know, 400 level class, but that's okay. So let, let's go back to your college days when you were thinking about fundamental processes in microorganisms or in cells <coughs> to the intro bio course. There are two main ways that bacteria become resistant to drugs. The first general category we call intrinsic resistance. Intrinsic resistance is really just sort of non-susceptibility. Okay, it's an inherent feature of the bacteria that makes it non-susceptible to a particular drug. Typically, we see that either there's no antibiotic target. Okay, so you've got a drug that has to target something. Maybe there's no target in that species. It's just not there. Uh, or the membrane is less permeable and doesn't allow the drug to diffuse in. Those are two common intrinsic mechanisms. So here's our buddy E. coli. We could try to hit E. coli with isoniazid, but isoniazid goes after a molecule called mycolic acid. And it's not present in E. coli. E. coli just doesn't even have a target. And so it doesn't even know the drug is there and it goes about its life you know, as, if, uh, as if everything is normal. 
no antibiotic target. We could throw vancomycin at it. But vancomycin is this big, rangy molecule. And E. coli, like other gram negatives, has a, a second membrane wrapped around it. Not just its cell membrane, but a second one called the LPS layer. It has these tiny little pore channels in it that really decide, by size exclusion, what has access to the interior of the cell and what doesn't. And vancomycin is way too big. It doesn't fit through the pores. So again, what we call that resistance, sort of. You can't kill E. coli with vancomycin, but it's due to an inherent property of the bacteria. So we call it an intrinsic resistance, really a lack of susceptibility. Make sense? Okay. Now, besides intrinsic resistance, we have acquired resistance. And this is where our research comes in. And there are two main ways that bacteria who are normally susceptible to a drug can acquire resistance. They can become resistant. The first is chromosomal mutation. So uh, usually a nucleotide substitution. In the key position, it was an A, and DNA polymerase makes a mistake and sticks a T there, and it alters the amino acid that goes in the final protein, and now all of a sudden it's resistant. Okay? <clears throat> the other, though, is what we call uh, horizontal gene transfer, specific resistance genes. Now, horizontal gene transfer is really interesting if you're not familiar with this. In humans, we pass down our genetic information vertically. Okay, so my DNA was passed on to my kids, the next generation. And when they grow up, if they have kids, it'll get passed down to their generation bacteria. They do that too through cell division. But they also have this crazy mechanism called horizontal gene transfer. So I can walk up to Ryan here if I can do this. And through contact, he can transfer his tall height genes to me. And not only can I get those genes, I can express them in a matter of minutes at these policy. That's horizontal gene transfer. Transfer of genetic information within the same generation, not getting passed down. Sometimes it's within the same species. Other times it's cross species. Like I walk outside, and if I touch the, if I could touch the green plant, and I can get the biochemical pathway for photosynthesis, and take on a little green color, start looking a little sick. But hey, I can photosynthesize. This is pretty. I mean, coffee, right? This is fabulous. I just go stand outside, get some ATP, and I got all the energy I need, right? Okay, that would be cross species horizontal gene transfer. Less common than within a species, but very, very possible among bacteria. Bacteria are so flexible genetically. It's a really remarkable thing. So, <clears throat> let's talk about a couple quick examples. Let's use Cipro again, the quinolone drug we talked about. Cipro attacks an enzyme called DNA gyrase. Okay? And DNA gyrase manages this big mess of a chromosome during DNA replication. It's all tangled up. And it, its role is to untangle it all and make sure it doesn't break and the two daughter cells both get a chromosome and so on. Cipro finds every copy of DNA gyrase, and there's thousands of them in the cells dividing, binds to them, and knocks out that ability so the cell dies. That's how Cipro works. Okay? There are key regions within the DNA gyrase gene that if you get a single point mutation, an amino acid switches in the DNA gyrase, so the Cipro can no longer bind to it, but it retains its function. So gyrase can still work, and the Cipro no longer attacks it and stops it. Our drug stopped working. The bacteria acquired resistance through a random mutation. Make sense? Now what about horizontal gene transfer? Okay, there are genes, for example, QNRA. QNR stands for quinolone resistance. QNRA is a gene that forms a, a protein called a pentapeptide repeat. And what a pentapeptide repeat protein does is it binds to the DNA gyrase and protects it. So the gyrase can still do its job, but the Cipro has lost its binding site. It can no longer bind to it and ruin its ability to function. Okay. This is one of those genes that is transferred by horizontal gene transfer. Bacteria A has the gene, bacteria B does not. They come into contact and the conditions are right. You know, they like each other, and, you know, whatever it has to happen for bacteria to fall in love. And it transfers the DNA over to the other one. And now they're both QNRA positive. They're both now resistant to Cipro and the other chromosome drugs. In one quick move, it takes about an hour. It's as easy as that. How does that happen? The primary way is through a molecule called a plasma. We're going to talk about plasma here in a couple minutes. Let me tell you what they are. Plasma is like a mini chromosome. So envision a, a small circular piece of DNA that codes for information that's not necessary for the bacteria to live. You can cure it of its plasma. And under lab conditions, it grows just fine and survives. But with the plasma, there's bonus information. There's things like drug resistance genes. So under certain conditions, it provides a benefit. Okay? It, it, it allows the bacteria to have a competitive advantage. And then it's going to pass its plasma down vertically to its daughter cells. 
And in most cases, and we'll look at some examples of these, the plasma can then induce its own transfer to another bacterium when they come in contact. And you get horizontal transfer and vertical transfer of that gene if there's a selective pressure and essentially a need for that gene to survive. Make sense? So what we've got here then are, we've got our intrinsic resistances, sort of lack of susceptibility. Not all drugs work against all bacteria. That's why you can't, there's no one size fits all antibiotic you can take when you've got an infection. But then there's acquired resistances that can either be picked up by mutations in the chromosome that alter the product in such a way that it's no longer susceptible, or through this crazy horizontal gene transfer mechanism. This is what our lab is focused on because it's likely that this mechanism right here is the primary reason for this explosive epidemic spread of drug resistance that we've seen around the world. It is that the majority of these resistances are plasma encoded and they're conjugated, meaning they have the ability to transmit from one species to the next. All they need is contact and a reason to transfer, a little selective pressure. And we're providing plenty of that in the way we do our clinical business. Questions about any of this? Everybody tracking with this? Good. Feel free to interrupt. I want to make sure you guys get this because we'll build on this. Okay, good. Oh, yeah, I, I wanted to mention that. So I said that that uh, QNR aging film is a kind of peptide repeat protein that binds the DNA gyrase and protects the target. Target protection is a common mechanism of these horizontally transferred uh, resistances. A couple other common mechanisms target replacement. <clears throat> Sometimes the gene simply replaces the target with a new variant that is less susceptible to the drug. So the bacteria can express it, they've got whatever that target is, and they can keep using it, and it's okay if their chromosomal copy is being poisoned by the drug because they've got an extra copy that's impervious to the drug. So target replacement, target protection, drug destruction. So sometimes the bacteria will produce an enzyme that will actually chew up the drug and degrade it. Sometimes it's just a single cleave. Uh, I'll give you an example of that with beta lactamases that we'll look at in just a minute. Uh, drug inactivation through modification. In many cases, we can acetylate, an enzyme will acetylate the drug, and it no longer functions, or it'll phosphorylate the drug, and it no longer functions. These are all ways that the bacteria can protect themselves, and in most cases, the genes are found on these, these plasmids. I have a question about the replacement and you know, the drug destruction with the enzymes. So, does that occur because bacteria are just all the time switching up their DNA, and so sometimes they happen to switch up the area that used to be the target? Or is it because, like, in response to, like, feeling like a pressure on that targeted area, they kind of mix up their base pair. Do you know what I mean? Like, is it in response or is it just naturally occurring so sometimes it happens to like save them? So target replacement would happen, imagine a bacterium, he's very happy, he's healthy, life's going well, he's got a, a, a chromosome and a gene that codes for some key enzyme in a metabolic pathway. If it picks up a plasma that codes for the same gene but a slight variation on it that's now resistant to, let's say, Cipro. Let me give you a real example. Sulfur drugs this is a common mechanism for sulfur drug resistance. A sulfur resistance gene is often a replacement for the gene that's the target. It's a slight variant of the sequence that's not susceptible. So now they're both in the bacteria. As soon as it gets hit, gets hit with sulfur, it's producing both genes, expressing both. The one from the chromosome is getting, getting inhibited, but the one on the plasma is still functioning. And so the bacteria can behave as if there's no drug there because its metabolic pathways are still intact. Okay, gotcha. So that's just happening because bacteria are always exchanging DNA, so sometimes they happen to have the one that's going to yes. save them. Okay. Yeah, and you figure, you know, an infection, maybe you got 100 billion bacteria in the infection. If two of them have a plasmid, it's all it takes. You kill everybody else off, and those two repopulate. And you've got a, a completely resistant infection. Uh, and then drug efflux, that's the last one. Uh, there are many genes that code for pumps that go in the membrane. So tetracycline is a great example. The tet drug diffuses into the cell. The pump grabs it and pumps it right back out as fast as it comes in. So it maintains a very low sub inhibitory concentration inside the cell. A lot of different ways bacteria can get around our, our, uh, our drug attacks. And many of these, possibly most, are found on these plasmids that can be shuttled around the room from one bacteria to the next. That's where we're going with this. Good? So what is this horizontal gene transfer? Three main mechanisms, and we're going to focus on one. I'm going to go through these relatively quickly. One is called transformation. When a bacterial cell dies, maybe it's in your gut, maybe it's in a wound, maybe it's in the soil, it bursts. Okay? It's part of its death cycle. It bursts open, and all of its insides come out. It's really good, right? And there's this DNA coming out too, and the DNA in the process gets chopped up. It's part of the process of cell destruction. So it gets chopped into fragments. There are some species of bacteria, and this isn't universal, 
and we call them competent bacteria, that can actually just sort of go around sampling this naked DNA that's around them. And you know, in a, in a population of one species, whatever they're sampling, they've already got it, right? You know, there's an E. coli next to an E. coli, and it bursts, and its DNA gets chopped up. It's already got that gene. It doesn't really need it, so nothing happens. But in some low frequency, it'll actually incorporate the new fragment into its own chromosome and sort of try it on for size. If it happens to be under a selective pressure, it's going to keep it. So if this is happening, let's say in your gut while you're on tetracycline chemotherapy for an infection, and you're going to have bacteria soaking up random pieces of DNA around them and potentially being transformed by picking up through random process a detect resistance gene from somebody else. And then you're going to survive and your progeny will survive. Now all of a sudden you've selected for a whole population that's resistant to, in this case, tetracycline. Okay? We call that transformation. I don't know how, it, it's hard to tell, there's disagreement in the scientific community how common this happens in nature. We can make it happen in the lab like that. How common this happens in nature, we're not sure. Another one that we know happens commonly in the lab is called transduction. I'm not going to go through the whole slide, that usually takes me an hour in my micro class. Here's the basic idea, okay? There are viruses that infect bacteria, they're called phage. And when they infect the bacteria, they get inside and make a bunch more of themselves bust the cell open and spread to new cells. Attach, get inside, make more, bust those open. And we've got a, a cycle of this viral infection. When they leave the cell as they burst it open, they often take some of the bacterial DNA with them. So if bacteria, let's say it's an E. coli who has a tet resistance gene on it, happens to get infected with a phage, it gets burst, some of those phage particles, one, two, three, who knows how many, are carrying tet resistance genes with them. They infect the next cell and they deliver those tet resistance genes. If that next cell was identical to the first, there's no change. And it's like, yeah, I already got that. I got those TET genes. Thanks for trying. If it's a new species, something other than the first, or if it doesn't have those TET resistance genes, it does now. And it can very easily incorporate those through something uh, uh, called recombination. It can move it back into its own chromosome. It can even become a permanent part of its chromosome. So we know this happens. This happens in your gut. This is happening while you're sitting here right now. Can you feel it? You can almost hear it. There's these phage cruising around the bacteria in your gut right now, bursting them open and shuffling genes around. The vast majority of those reactions have no impact. Every now and then, one of them has a major impact. You get a brand new population that's resistant to a drug, for example, or has some other property. Now, the third one is the one that we focus on because uh, very likely this is the most common mechanism of horizontal gene transfer. It's called conjugation. We talk about plasmids. Many plasmids contain all the genes. There's a good 20, 30 genes involved to induce conjugation. And what that means is they'll produce something we call a sex pillus. It's a big probe that reaches around blindly in the dark, looking for the surface of another cell that it doesn't recognize, and therefore likely doesn't have the same plasmid. It draws it in close, opens up pores, and then runs a copy of the plasmid off and shoots it over to the other cell. Now if the cell already had the plasmid, there's no change. If that cell didn't have that plasmid, it's now been transformed into something new. It now has a completely different genotype and phenotype because it's picked this up through conjugation. Our work focuses on this process here. This happens literally thousands of times per second in your gut. This is going on like crazy right now. Most of what's getting transferred is meaningless. But there are plenty of plasmids that have a lot of meaning to them from a clinical perspective. We're going to take a look at some of those. How are we doing? Any questions that you want to ask about? Uh, so how is this spread? Right? We realize one e, one e. coli can sit next to a salmonella and you know become good friends and swap plasmids. Okay, so that great one cell to one cell. How is this spread more on a, a public health level? Lots of people involved, right? <clears throat> well, the simple use of antibiotics is going to be the major selective pressure. We use them. You know, let, let's start with humans. You know, the vast majority of you have had antibiotics at least once in your life. When you do that, you completely saturate your gut and you're exposing all your gut flora to those antibiotics. But if it's absorbed by the intestinal tract, like most antibiotics are, it's perfused to your entire body, every tissue, from the, the, the sinuses to the urinary tract. Every tissue's been perfused. And the microbes that are part of those are being exposed and challenged. The ones that survive the challenge persist. Right? They survive because they had some level of resistance or a lower level of susceptibility. So every single time we take these antibiotics, we are altering our own microflora towards a microflora that is resistant to the drugs we would like to use when an infection comes along. 
You might be going after a sinus infection, but you've completely altered your gut microflora or your eye microflora or your mouth microflora in the process. That may or may not come back to bite us at some point. So the use and misuse, and there's plenty of misuse of antibiotics uh, as well. Uh, we use, so about 70% of the sheer tonnage of antibiotics we use in the United States goes to our food animals. Seems like an easy target for correcting some of this problem. 70% of the sheer tonnage that we just bathe planet Earth in, at least in the United States, is going to our cows, chickens, and uh, pigs. Now part of it is, is protective, it's prophylactic because they're living in close quarters and swapping bacteria and stuff and we don't want to get them sick. Part of it though is to boost size. You can add almost 10% to a cow in the months before market if you have penicillin to, to its food mix. Nobody really understands why. It probably changes the absorption in his, in his gut in some way. But it gets bigger. And that improves the profit margin for the cow farmers, and that lowers the prices for you and me. So we as consumers demand ground beef at $2.99 a pound, and this is what it takes to get ground beef at $2.99 a pound. This is the system we've demanded based on our, our, our economy. So if that's, if that's it, so be it. We, just, we have to realize there are consequences to how we live with that. We've got to consider those consequences. Uh, veterinary work for sure. Uh, there, there's less known in the veterinary world about the impacts of drug, uh, of drug selection on drug resistant organisms, um, but there is a growing body of evidence, everything from you know, puppies to cougars. And so uh, we recognize that we've got to be good stewards of these drugs, both in the human clinic and in the veterinary clinic, if we're going to uh, maintain these drugs. Remember what I said about Cipro? It's only about 15 years old. Okay? And we're just about ready to shelf it because the percentages of, of susceptible strains have dropped so much that it, it's becoming risky when you've got a, a, a patient who has a severe infection to give them Cipro. And you're, you're counting and banking on that Cipro working, you know, and you're, you're gambling your life. Yeah, it's a pretty high probability it's a good gamble. You know, those probabilities are, we're losing them pretty fast with certain drugs. Uh, and that's happening in the veterinary world as well. There's a lot of attention right now on environmental fecal pollution, whether it's human fecal pollution uh, or um, due to animal operations, especially confined animal feeding operations. So you've got feed lots, for example, where you've got a high concentration of, uh, of, environment, of uh, animal manure, animal feces. You figure if you feed a pig penicillin for six months every day, you're going to select for penicillin-resistant bacteria in, in the feces, and he's going to be cooking it out with a ton for you. It's got to go somewhere else. It's got to go somewhere else. And so we're creating these hot spots of drug resistant bacteria all around us. The question is, how do you get from those hot spots possibly back to us? And you're thinking, well, it's okay, I'm not a pig farmer, I'll be all right, I can handle this. Right? We just got a you know, better healthcare coverage for pig farmers, and we find that's the solution. Right? Part of the problem is that they can find their way back in the human community, and there's, there's growing evidence that it's happening. Uh, farmers do get sick more often with drug resistant infections than non farmers. Okay, so just put that out there. If you're going to be a farmer, be aware. Right? And you're more likely to have a drug-resistant infection. Wind and water are known to relocate uh, pathogens and drug-resistant pathogens from you know, areas like this. Right? When this snow melts off, it's going to percolate down into the groundwater. Groundwater around these, these animal operations is always contaminated with drug-resistant bacteria. Surface water in the region is always contaminated and wind downwind, air downwind, is always contaminated as well. Experiment after experiment, paper after paper is demonstrating this pretty clearly. What happens on, this isn't Vegas, right? What happens on the farm doesn't stay on the farm. Okay, it's, it's true in the weather, it's probably not true in Vegas either, but uh, you know, yeah, Facebook and all these things, it doesn't stay in Vegas either, but it, it certainly doesn't stay on the farm, it doesn't stay in the wet, and it moves, and we'd be really irresponsible to say, oh, well, it's happening there, that's not gonna affect my world absolutely affecting the world already. Uh, a lot of growing evidence that insects are important vectors in ag, moving drug-resistant pathogens from the ag site into the surrounding uh, neighborhoods and communities of people. And then uh, this beautiful little guy here, uh, I think is probably one of the guiltier parties in the wetlands where we work. And if you ever go to wetlands, there are hundreds if not thousands of shorebirds. There is a very good evidence coming out of Europe and Russia, and we're beginning to see people studying this in the United States showing that migratory birds, and especially shorebirds, <clears throat> can carry drug-resistant pathogens, 
human pathogens that are identical to the ones we're seeing cropping up in the, in the hospital, identical. And they're carrying the same identical drug-resistant phenotype, which means either they're getting it from us or we're getting it from them. Realistically, it's probably a mutual exchange through wind, through water, through dust, through them pooping on your car, whatever it is they got to do. These guys are very likely the ones that are relocating and reshuffling and moving things from the wetlands back into our community. All right. Questions about that first half? We've got about 20 minutes to, to show data at this point. I want to make sure everybody understands the premise of this before we get Anything you want to ask about? You can drink of water while you think about it. So we've talked about what the problem is, hopefully you're convinced there is an issue, both in the clinic and in the environment. We're building these environmental hotspots, these reservoirs that have the potential least, to be redisseminated back into the human and animal communities. I'm going to show you a little bit of our research, some of the highlights over the last few years, uh, looking at some of these environmental reservoirs. Some of the things that we found with quinolone resistance genes, uh, something called ESVLs, a very important group of genes that um, protect bacteria from the beta-lactam drugs. So Penicillin, cephalosporins, carbapenems, more than half of the prescriptions we write are fall into that beta-lactam category. And so it's a very, very important group of resistance genes. And then we're going to look at some plasmids that carry multiple resistance genes on a single plasmid. So when the one plasmid moves or gets selected, the bacteria get more than just one resistance associated with it. <clears throat> Alright, so the first approach we take is to use PCR. Is everybody familiar with PCR? Polymerase chain reaction. It's a a, those of you who are, it's a molecular tool that lets you find kind of a genetic needle in the haystack. You're looking for a single fragment of DNA in a mass of millions of fragments of DNA. So we'll use PCR to sift through these environmental samples to find specific resistance genes. And then we can, uh, we can clone them and sequence them. Like cloning in this sense doesn't mean like making sheep that are the same or whatever. Okay, cloning refers to uh, separating them out into separate E. coli populations. So Separate out, separate out the different resistance genes that we find in our original samples, and we can even quantify them. So about uh, not quite 10 years ago, uh, a woman named uh, Amy Pruden at Virginia Tech <clears throat> proposed that we need to begin looking at drug resistance genes like any other blue. We need to think of it quantitatively, we need to think in terms of it, the, the DNA's behavior. The DNA itself, not the pathogen, the DNA. In the same way we think about heavy metals and lead pollution or organics like CDs. We track them, we follow them, we try to understand where they're going, try to understand their physical chemistry, their impact on biological things. She's made the argument, and I think it's a very strong one, that we need to think about drug resistance genes as an environmental pollutant because of those horizontal transfer mechanisms we talked about. It doesn't matter if the bacterial host is some wetland organism that couldn't you know, make a flower sick. It, it doesn't matter because it can, it can move and it becomes a reservoir and, and a shuttle. So we can quantify those using something called quantitative PCR. <clears throat> We've got two primary sites, Famosa Slough in Point Loma and the Tijuana River Estuary. The Famosa Slough receives water from the San Diego River watershed as well as, of course, flushing from the ocean. And you can see the city limits. This is a very urban area. Okay? Urban, but good infrastructure, as opposed to the Tijuana River Estuary on the border. Very urban. We've got Tijuana, we've got Tecate. got a much bigger watershed and all the activities in that watershed. Um, but the infrastructure is poor, and therefore we end up with a lot more pollution, both industrial pollution and wastewater pollution. Every time it rains, and it kind of flushes down, uh, flushes right literally down into uh, into these wetlands. So we're comparing two urban sites, one with good infrastructure, one with poor uh, wastewater infrastructure. Very busy slide. I'm going to point out a couple things here for you. <clears throat> so several years ago, we said, all right, well let's let's see if these quinolone resistance genes that are found on plasmids might actually be washing into these weapons. Let's find out. And so we used PCR. So what did we do? We sampled six locations in Famosa Slough, and we called them FAM1 through FAM6. We sampled six locations in the Tijuana River Estuary. And each location, we collected four different samples of sediment of mud. We extracted DNA from those and used PCR to search for a set of genes, any of which can provide resistance to Cipro and those quinolone drugs we've been talking about. Good? <clears throat> so these two are Famosa Slough. These two are T1 Estuary. Top is the dry season. It hasn't rained for many, many, many weeks. Bottom 
was during the rainy season. So let's look at a couple of major things that you can see, major patterns in here. First of all, hopefully you can see T1 River Estuary, we find far greater diversity of these resistance genes, and we find them more frequently. In almost every sample we look in, we can find them. Compared to Famosa Slough, uh, which is uh, a much leaner, right? we're finding far fewer uh, and far less diversity. And then if we look at top versus bottom, dry season versus wet season, you can see that the rains are clearly, and the rainwater and stormwater is clearly a vector for washing these materials from whatever their source is in that watershed and concentrating them down in those wetlands. And we're finding them in the muds of those wetlands. So even in our well-contained Famosa Slough, we go from low diversity, relatively low frequency, we're only finding one of the genes, <coughs> We get a good rain, we find it more frequently, and we find a couple different genes showing up as well. So even in our well-manicured urban environment here in San Diego, we're seeing this effect. You go down to the border, and obviously it's much more dramatic because of the lack of infrastructure. Even in the dry season, okay, this is the reservoir concept illustrated right there. It hasn't rained for months at this point. Even in the dry season, almost all of these genes can be found in almost every sample we look at. There is a reservoir building up. Can you guys visualize that from this figure? Okay. Uh, this next figure is a little tougher to read, but I'll interpret it for you. We're just looking at several days through a series of storms, and we're using quantitative PCR just to track one of those quinolone resistance genes, the QNRA gene. The arrow shows a day of rain, and we had detectable but low levels of QNRA, and the next day as the river started flowing, it spiked. And then it started to drop down. We got another rain that was smaller, and we got a smaller spike associated with it, and then it trickled down to where we couldn't detect it any further. So it does seem pretty clear between these two figures that it's that storm water that's our primary delivery mechanism. What this does for us, guys, is this gives us a handle on what to focus on. If we can do a better job of managing storm water, we can minimize this. Our storm water is our major vector moving this stuff at least into the wetlands. But it's moving it back out of the wetlands we don't know yet. I'm suspicious of those birds. Didn't mm -hmm. that one look suspicious? You just had that. <laughs> All right, let me show you another type of gene that we've, we've gone after in the same way. Okay, it's called CTXM. CTXM is a really, really globally common version of what we call an ESBL, an extended spectrum beta lactamase. An ESBL, basically chews up any of the beta lactam drugs. Penicillin, cephalosporins, carbapenems, we write that that category makes up more than half of all the prescriptions we write in the United States. One gene can wipe out an entire category that makes up more than half of our options. In some cases, for some infections, it's our, those beta lactams are our only options, which means in the presence of a CTXM gene, we don't have an option. It's between you and your immune system. Bring your immune system comes through for you, but we got no clinical intervention to help with it. Okay. CTXM, very, very important globally. Uh, far more abundant in Mexico than in the US. It's slowly creeping into the US, but far more abundant in Mexico than in the US. I'm going to point out just a couple of things here. We use PCR just to detect whether or not these things were there. These different groups are different types of CTXM genes. We don't need to worry too much, except I'll mention that group one and group nine globally are the most abundant ones found in the clinic. These are the two that show up all the time. We didn't see group 9 in any of our samples. We did see group 1. We saw it in the T1 River Estuary during the rainy season, but not during the dry season. We couldn't pick it up. Not at all in Famosa Slough. Good news. And we looked at two wastewater treatment plants. The South Bay International Wastewater Treatment Plant, which treats sewage from Tijuana, and the Point Loma Wastewater Treatment Plant, which treats sewage from San Diego. We found it in both of those. So it does appear to be part of the gut flora of both of our cities. And it's only finding its way into the Tijuana River sediments, but not into our Formosa sediments. Despite the fact that you and I, or at least some of us, maybe you guys not me, somebody's carrying CTX right? <clears throat> and we did find some of these group two, but only in the wastewater treatment plants. So this gene that is globally, clinically so important is showing up in the mud in our wetlands. That's the connection I'm trying to make sure we're all making. A uh, couple things just to give you, this is a little more uh, nerdy science than, than application. Um, these group 1 CTXM genes that we saw out in the wetlands, before our study there were a total of 28 of them in the Gen Bank database. We just found 158 novel ones that have never been seen before in the Gen Bank database. 
What that tells us is there's a lot of diversity, a lot of versions of this gene in circulation out there that we're not detecting just by waiting until therapeutic failure with a patient, which is how we find all the clinical ones. We wait until we can kind of treat somebody who's extremely sick, therapy fails, then we go to the lab and find what genes are involved and say, oh, it's, it's this CTXMG male. New version they haven't seen before. That method has produced 28. In one gram of sediment, we found 158 new versions of it. There's a ton of diversity out there. We know nothing about how that diversity, uh, from a sequence level, plays out in terms of how they behave. You know, what, what their phenotype is, what their, their biochemical activity is. And we're, see, we're picking up at about 10 to the minus fifth. So what that tells us is about, um, about four in every 100,000 bacteria in that gram of sediment are carrying that CTXM. You're thinking, oh, well, that's, that you can probably barely even detect that, four in every 100,000. Well, in one gram of bacteria, you've got about 10 billion. So you've got about 10 or 100,000 of those guys per gram. That's a very high number. It's a very high number. When, when these things are washing in, they're coming in extremely high abundance. And uh, very, very likely that they're being moved around while the birds are not getting through and everything else. I keep blaming the birds. I should go easy on them. Until we've proven them guilty, right? All right, so here's how we're going to wrap it up. Uh, I'm going to show you a few plasmids that we've captured. So all these genes that I've shown you so far, when we do PCR, we just get the gene. We know nothing about the host or the genetic context of that gene. So we've also been looking for plasmids themselves. And we have some pretty cool tricks for convincing the, the wetland bacteria to give up their plasmids. Once we've got their plasmids, we can do what's called an antibiogram. That's this picture right here, where we basically put a lawn of the bacteria with the plasmid <coughs> on an auger petri dish. And we put a bunch of discs. We've got a panel of 30 some odd drugs that we test. We can determine against which drugs the plasmid confers resistance and which ones it has nothing to do with. And the other thing that we're doing, this is where Brian Botts comes in, is we're doing heavy duty sequence analysis. We're sequencing these entire genomes, assembling them, and trying to correlate the genotype, the sequence genotype, with the phenotype to see if we can understand those. I'm going to very quickly show you four examples of plasmids, and I promise I'll click. You guys have a chance to ask questions if you have any. P1E11 is the first plasmid we captured. Um, this is one that can't move by itself. It doesn't have those transfer genes that let it conjugate. If it's in a cell that has another conjugate of plasma that's fully self-transmissible, it'll piggyback and they'll move together. But if it's in a cell by itself, it can't move itself. Okay, so it's going to be a little bit more limited in its mobility. <clears throat> uh, the green that you see here is all backbone, all maintenance for the plasma for its replication and so on. Yellow. Uh, these are all what we call jumping genes. These are mobile genetic elements, transposons, insertion sequences, integrons, pieces of DNA that actually can move themselves in and out of other pieces of DNA and grab things and bring them with them. The way that a plasma turns into a collection like this is you get these transposases, these transposons, moving out of one plasma that had tetracycline resistance and dragging the tetracycline resistance with it and sticking it into a novel plasma or into a chromosome for that matter. So what we see here is we've got some TET resistance here. Uh, these acetyltransferases are amino glycoside resistance that's streptomycin, gentamicin, etc. Uh, quacky delta is kind of scary. This is an efflux pump that works real well on things like Lysol cleaning agents. Okay, so bacteria with this plasma, you Lysol down a, a tabletop. This guy's there, and unless you physically remove it, it's just going to pump the Lysol out and go on, you know, causing trouble. Uh, DFRA is a sulfa resistance uh, gene, UVR is UV resistance, so it can be exposed on the skin, for example. AMPC is one of those beta lactamases I was talking about, breaks apart these beta lactam drugs. And then down here we've got some uh, what look like metal resistance genes, we're just beginning to test these. We're finding at the very least that these are conferring cobalt resistance. That may explain how a plasmid like this could persist in the absence of drug selection. You find your way out of the wetlands, why does it stick around? What's the selection? There's probably not tetracycline in the wetlands, at least not much, or very often. But there's always going to be heavy metals, especially in an urban polluted wetland. And that may be the selection. You have to remember, these are all, all co-located. You select with cobalt, you get all these other resistances. You don't just get the cobalt resistance. Right? There's this genetic linkage that takes place. So there's one, and you can see uh, you've got about 200 copies per cell. So there's a hygiene dosage associated with it. Uh, P3P11, you can see a lot of yellow, a lot of those jumping genes we talked about. You 
can see some green, some backbone. This is also a non-self-transmissible plasmid. It's uh, um, mobilizable, meaning it needs help from one of these self-transmissible plasmids. Tetracycline resistance, uh, streptomycin resistance. Here's another beta-lactamase here. This one has something novel we haven't talked about, though. Bag C, bag D. These genes form what's called an addiction system. Addiction system. Bag C produces a toxin, saturates the cell with toxin. Bag D is the antitoxin. If during cell division, one of the daughter cells through random and stochastic properties happens to not get a copy of the plasmid, it's saturated in the toxin and it doesn't have the ability to produce the antitoxin, so it dies. Okay, this is like the worst case scenario of if you ever leave me, I'll kill you. Okay? B, B, sorry, that, the, the plasmid here can, can't leave. Bacteria that pick this up cannot lose it. They die if they lose it. That's a pretty cool way to stick around. Pretty cool way to persist. Uh, Petri M1 is one we've been working on a lot here. Uh, a lot of backbone. This is fully self-transmissible. This thing shuttles around from, from bacteria to bacteria with no problem at all. Uh, we've got beta-lactamase. We've got um, another aminoglycoside resistance. That quacky delta keeps showing up. Right? That's that lysol resistance gene. We've got some sulfur resistance genes in there. QNR, we've got a quinolone resistance gene in here. It's the first one that we've seen on one of our plasmids. Um, I think that's all I want to say about M1, and then I'll finish with this one, T11. This one's hard to see the way we printed it, I apologize. <clears throat> but I'm going to point out a couple of things. This fully self transmissible this guy moves around all on his own, doesn't need help from anybody. Has some resistance genes on here. Boy, it's just not very clear, is it? Um, it's got tetracycline resistance over here. It's got some aminoglycoside streptomycin-like resistance here. It's got an arsenic resistance operon, another heavy metal resistance operon. And here it's got one of those CTXM genes that we detected in an earlier study. We found a full plasma now with one of those CTXM genes. Now the, the last thing I'll leave you with is that these plasmids aren't as innocent as they seem. Right? They're not just giving drug resistance. This plasma here has an entire section from here to about here, and a little further, about here, that is all virulence. It's all genes involved in causing disease, all genes involved in infection. So there's a section of genes that produce proteins that form a metabolic pathway to produce siderophores. What siderophores are? Siderophores are iron chelating proteins. Okay, so many habitats, including parts of your body, your bloodstream, the urinary tract, very poor in iron. So for them, we will colonize those, they have to scavenge iron. They can secrete this siderophore, and there's a receptor gene on there as well. They can grab the siderophore now that it's gotten stolen some iron from somewhere, maybe from your hemoglobin and bring it back in again. So it's a way for a bacteria who has this to be able to colonize an iron poor body region like the urine region. Okay? The other things we find on here, there's a hemolysin, a cytolytic toxin, that will bust cells open, including red blood cells. So if this guy's in your bloodstream, it's busting open your red blood cells, stripping iron off of your hemoglobin, it's going to make you sick. In the urinary tract, it can actually be given enough time to begin to degrade the, the urethra. Or, or higher up organs in the urinary tract. There's an attachment protein that's specific for carbohydrates in the surface of the urethra, so it's very good at attaching to those. And then there's a protease on the surface that lets it degrade protein in connective tissue, so it can invade deeper into tissues. So here's a bacterium that has some very important, or a plasma, pardon me, has some very important resistance genes on it, and an entire cassette of virulence factors that could conceivably turn you know, a very nice kid into a very evil kid that could cause disease and be resistant to the drugs that we want to hit. So let's go full circle. It came out of the mud and one of the wet roots. That's the connection I'm trying to help you guys see here. We have an epidemiological problem in our hands where we're helping to redistribute all this for our activities. And there's absolutely no way this isn't coming back to that. Take home points, human clinical uses may not be the only causes. Right? These environmental reservoirs very well may be feeding back in. Bacteria can share antibiotic resistance genes with one another through horizontal gene transfer. Animals and other shuttles like water and wind may cycle resistant bacteria back to the human population. And these resistance genes and the multi-drug resistance plasmids are indeed washing our urban labs. And the jury's out as to whether those pose an acute or a chronic health threat. They don't, but we don't have the data to know for sure at this point. All right.
right, I'm sorry I went a few minutes long, but I'd be happy to take any questions. Suddenly took away Cipro or penicillin or something or other. Um, it, would there then be a negative selection pressure such that the bacteria would tend to lose these resistant genes? Yeah, great, great question. So, first question: Is there a metabolic burden? Yes. These things are huge. I mean, the last one I showed you is over 100,000 base pairs. That's a lot of phosphate, it's a lot of ATP, it's a lot of nucleotide resources. A lot of those resources going into building this thing. And we don't have a copy number on that one, but you saw the copy numbers on the others. They were in the hundreds per cell. So you take those 50,000 base pairs on average, base pairs, so 100,000 nucleotides, each of which has the energy of an ATP and requires an ATP to link together, and you multiply it 200, 250 times per cell just to maintain huge metabolic burden. The second half is up in the air. The jury's out on it. Okay, so what we see is sometimes if we take a selective pressure off our bacterium, we may lose a plasmid. It may get kicked out because of the negative pressure, negative selective pressure. More often than not, it seems to stick around and we don't understand those persistence mechanisms. It's an important piece to the story that needs to be better understood. So the answer is yes, um, but there, it appears to be more complex than that because there are some things that seem to keep it around, whether it's those addiction systems that ensure that whether there's selective pressure or not, you never get rid of it, uh, or if there's something else happening that we don't know about yet. Great question. Yeah. Um, so one And how, how do we deal with this problem and the vector problem? The vector being the birds, and we want to promote the birds. We want to restore wetlands. Uh, I think we need to continue to restore wetlands, build them back up. We need to promote the bird usage of the land and, and bird numbers and so on. Um, but on the back side, we've really got to be making it a healthier place somehow. Uh, and controlling that wastewater is probably step one. I don't think it's the only step. I think it's step one. So in restoring wetlands, there needs to also be simultaneous like back work. Otherwise, you're making this huge reservoir that's even more. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? You, you sort of hinted at in your very last um, 
point there that you, you weren't sure about the, the threat that this is posing to humans and animals. And of course, we're thinking about wildlife species mm -hmm. that aren't traditionally treated with, that, that they're ever treated with antibiotics. Mm -hmm. Do you know if anyone's looking at the incidence of just bacterial infections? Is that increasing? Um, I do not know if anybody's looking into that. Uh, I think Nico's girl feel that uh, the, the county vet would be the person to ask. Um, he has oversight of that kind of work, and um, I've never had a chance to ask him. Uh, we got to keep in mind that antibiotic resistance, like we saw in plasma T11, is not the only part of the story, right? That virulence, even though the CTXM drug resistance gene isn't going to affect a gull, uh, those virulence genes, in theory, at least, could. could. So, so there could be an increased incidence of infection based on on the types of, of plasmids that are in circulation. Barbara, do you know if there are any <coughs> incidences of uh, encountering infections that are not susceptible to treatment in in our collection? I don't know. Are there any vet types here? No. Any vets? <laughs> I don't. I don't know. It's a good question. Thank you. Seen that Interesting. Other questions? Yeah. yeah. I just want to know how you can explain why these two samples genes that are showing these high levels of genetic variation, so the, you know, the existing variants we're finding. So is there because of the Assuming most of those genes are coming from somebody's gut, where there's going to be a stronger selective pressures. And we compared that, those degrees of variation to what we saw in the wetlands. There's much, much higher variation in the wetlands, including, in some cases, well, three out of several hundred, but including uh, mutations in the active site that might render it inactive. So what we think is happening is when they're out in the wetlands, when they're out in nature, um, genetic drift can happen without any selection. So you can just get mutations popping up wherever. There's no selection to, to, to drive it one direction or another. But when it's in the human gut or in an animal gut, especially if the animal is being treated, say horses, cattle, whatever, um, there's going to be more directional selection, making sure that fewer sites can actually vary. Uh, so can I fully explain it? No. But it's very likely that these ones that we're seeing in the environment just have more time to drift genetically uh, without any sort of directional pressure. Other questions you guys have? Bacteria with phage, remember those viruses that infect bacteria? 
If you're concerned that, let's say, someone's gut has an overpopulation of uh, drug-resistant C. diff, something like that, phage, viruses that will target just the C. diff could be delivered as a therapy. Try to bust up the C. diff and allow the rest of the bacteria to naturally be colonized. Another similar approach is there are phages that, for whatever reason, are really attracted to that sex pillus. And they'll bind to the sex pillus and interfere with the process of conjugation. And so there are people tinkering with them. But they're trying to figure out if they can use a phage therapy that targets the pillus and therefore limits any of that horizontal transfer. It doesn't kill the bacteria, but stops them from swapping all these resistance and virulence genes. And phage therapy is, is, is probably the closest thing I can think of what you're proposing. It's a clever idea. What else? Yeah, Dr. Thank you very much.